How do you build a $6 billion software empire, power the technology behind half of all car sales in North America, and still be completely unknown outside of the car business? Today we find out because I'm speaking with Brian McDonald, CEO of CDK Global, the largest car sales SaaS provider in the United States and the biggest tech company you've probably never heard of. We discuss how CDK helps to sell over half of US auto sales, over $500 billion a year, deciding when to buy, build, or partner in new business verticals, the future of small dealerships in the crosshairs of consolidation, how Chinese car brands will enter the North American market, and much more. Don't forget to click subscribe so you never miss an episode. What's up, everyone? This is Car Dealership Guy. You're listening to the Car Dealership Guy podcast, which is my effort to give you access to the most unbiased and transparent insights into the car market. But before we get into the show, this episode is brought to you by Valvoline. You might know Valvoline as the original motor oil. After all, they've been at it since 1866. But to their dealership customers, there's so much more. When you partner with Valvoline, your dealership not only gets access to legendary Valvoline products, but also to their customer business solutions, marketing resources, consumer promotions, and other programs that go beyond the traditional supplier partnership. Valvoline can help you drive your service department by streamlining operations and increasing revenue with hands-on technician and sales advisor training, state-of-the-art service lane technology, and a robust preventative maintenance chemical program. They even have programs to help you sell more cars and increase trade-ins. What other fixed ops vendor can say that? So what's all this mean for you? Fewer vendors, more value, and a brand your customers know and trust. Valvoline's reinventing how supplier partners with the dealership. For more information about how Valvoline can become your ultimate fixed ops partner, visit partner.valvoline.com or click the link in the show notes below. Before we get into the show, I'd like to thank CDK Global for coming on as a guest and also sponsoring this episode. I uh, grew up in East Coast, Canada, in a small town. I always loved uh, cars, and uh, there wasn't much to do in our town. So when we, were, when we were young, we would literally sit around and try to guess, you know, what car was coming up the street, and then we'd argue whether it was a 72 or 73. And so I just, I just always, you know, liked cars. I wouldn't say I'm a car collector or anything, but I just kind of like cars. And then when I graduated college... Uh, I got my first job at the General Motors in Canada. And that's kind of how I came into the car business. What what led you from there? You know, I'll, I mean, Sunoco, Herc Rentals, CDK, right? It's, it's, I think, very admirable career and very, you know, impressive companies. What led you to that next step in, you know, Sunoco and then from there on? Yeah, I really, well, I really spent uh, the, the first 13 years of my career at GM. I moved around the world with GM, five countries, one of them twice. And then I, I went to Dell here in Austin, and uh, that's how I kind of got into technology. You know, I ended up going to Sunoco as the CFO because uh, that was just a logical career s- step for me. And then I became CEO. So, and then I ultimately from there came to, you know, went to Hertz, went to CDK. So I like to say that I've, I've done autos and technology um, or make the juice that uh, runs the car. So that's kind of how I describe my time at uh, Sunoco. I was making, I wasn't in the car business, but I was making the juice for the cars. So you've had, this is your, your second go around at CDK. Tell me about the first go around. Why did you make it to CDK to begin with? Why did you decide to you know, jump on this opportunity? What was going through your head at that time? Yeah, I, I think what, um, what was uh, really interesting about CDK for me when I came to CDK the first time was, you know, it was a spinoff of ADP and I, I had been involved in some other corporate spinoffs. So for those of, uh, those of you who don't know what a spinoff is, you, you have a big company and then you take part of that company and then you totally separate it into its own company. So CDK was a spinoff of, of ADP, which was a much larger company. I really like spinoffs because you get to take what you like from the big company uh, but you get to leave behind what you don't like. And so you can create a new culture uh, around around uh, what you like from the old company, but what you want to do new. And so I was really attracted to CDK because it was it was a spinoff, number one. And it was really, a, a, you know, it was technology, which I like, and it was automotive, which I like. So it was kind of like marrying the, marrying the two industries uh, that I like the most. I'd have to imagine, you know, you come from rental company, prior to that, Sunoco. Suddenly being at the helm of technology, what was that transition like for you? It doesn't seem to be like the traditional transition that I'd expect. And so I'd love to understand like what, just what goes through your head when you take over a technology company at this point in your career? Yeah, I generally had a non-traditional career in terms of, you know, changing industries, moving through multiple industries, which is, you know, not really normative for a CEO or even most C-suite level people. 
And so what I learned along the way, and I think just part of who I am, I'm just naturally curious, ask a lot of questions, listen a lot, um, you know, visit customers, listen from them, and then, you know, figure out the right places to go into the detail to understand like the, you know, the detail, you can't go into all the detail, but trying to figure out the right places. Um, and so really just a, a lot of listening and learning. And, you know, look, if you're, if you're the CEO, you're running the company, I'm not writing code, right? I'm not, I'm not, I'm not writing code. You know, I'm helping the direct the strategy, of the company, the operations of the company, uh, listening to the customers, helping our people, getting the right people in the right jobs. You know, if you're if you're a good listener and you get good people around you and you can make decisions, you have to make decisions, then, uh, you know, you can uh, you can move the ball down the field. So before we talk about what you're working on today, I want to understand you're now at CDK. It's 2016, 2017. What are the biggest challenges that you're grappling with? Right. And, and, and specifically, what solutions are you working for at the time for the car business? Obviously, you know, we've gone through a lot of technological change here in the last four or five years, especially after the consumer behavior changes and just everything that happened with uh, through 2020, 2021. But at that time, what was the what was top of mind for you? Yeah, I mean, at that time, the company was a public company, publicly traded with a number of activist investors, um, you know, who were who were pushing a, an agenda on the company. Sounds fun. Um, and there was a yeah, it was a lot of fun. And um, <laughs> and uh and so, you know, there was there was a lot of external pressure on the company around, you know, profitability. And uh, so there was, a, there was a lot of work uh, happening inside the company to change things inside the company. And then from the business side, it was really trying to, the company historically had been pretty siloed. So it was really, I was very focused on how do we get the pieces of the company working better together? I, I called it one CDK. I used to say at that time that, you know, we, we needed to stop being C and D and K and we need to be one CDK. And so it was really trying to get the company to work together, try to get the products to work together better, try to get our teams to work together better. Fast forward from there, right? Why did you leave at the time? And then what brought you back to CDK? Yeah, so, uh, you know, it's pretty widely um, reported uh, that uh, CDK tried to go private in 2018. I tried to take the company private in 2018. There were lots of... Uh, leaks and the stock price ran up and a deal couldn't happen. And so, uh, you know, so after that, it was uh, hard to, to reconnect with the, with the board of directors and we decided to, um, you know, part ways. Now, now let's fast forward to 2022, right? So you come back to CDK, what's on your mind? Like, I want to know the nitty gritty, like, what is the first <laughs> thing that you're thinking of? You know, that's, I don't want to say keeping you up at night, but like, this is the challenge I'm here to solve. What is it? What is that? Well, I mean, the first, you know, CDK stock did not trade very well, um, you know, from from 2018 to, to 2021, 22. Um, most software stocks at the time went kind of like that. And CDK stock, you know, went like that. So, so 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 CDK was not well understood in the public markets at the time for, for lots of reasons. But but, you know, I worked with Brookfield, you know, Brookfield being the owner, right? Brookfield is the owner large asset manager, Canadian firm, private equity. And, um, you know, we, we concluded that, um, you know, this company has a great product, sticky, great customer base, that um, dealerships are not going away, um, that EVs are coming, but probably are going to come at a slower rate uh, than people were thinking in 21, 22. So that was turned out to be pretty prescient, that EVs are not going to destroy the uh, profitability of dealerships. Uh, that dealer consolidation uh, was going to continue to happen, uh, which is good for CDK because we service, you know, the larger enterprise class customers. And fundamentally, uh, we thought that there was a, you know, good product, good business. And so, you know, we got uh, investors to um, stand behind us for $8.5 billion and we bought the company. Mm -hmm. So you just said a couple of really important things here. You mentioned that, you know, you believe that dealerships aren't going away, that you know EVs maybe came on too strong, and a couple other things. How did you come at these conclusions? Because it's clear that you know there's some really large, sophisticated players in this industry, OEMs or other vendors that you know are acting in ways that sort of go against what you just said. 
And it's pretty mind boggling, right? Given, you know, the data is pretty out there and it's clear. But I want to understand from you, like, how did you arrive at those conclusions that, you know, you almost make it seem so obvious, yet it seems like others are not seeing that. What's the story behind this? Well, I read a lot. Um, I'm, you know, I was in the energy industry, so I, I read a lot about commodities. I, I read a lot about the, you know, metal supply, uh, supply chain issues for the metals for EVs. I mean, I just, I just read a lot of stuff. I read people that have contrarian views, and, and you know, it's, I guess, it's a, my gray hair. Uh, you know, I've been, you know, in or around this industry for a long time. You know, I, I just felt like, uh, you know, e- EVs would, would come, obviously. But that uh, you know, the, you would, you get the early adopters first, like any new product, like any anything, any industry with a new product, and that you know the cost cost was going to be high for EVs. People were going to have range anxiety. You know, charging charging infrastructure is just not there, and um, and so I, I you know I, I just felt no. Look, we did lots of research, and you know we hired consultants, and we looked at data and all those types of things. But, um, you know, I'm a bit of a math guy. When you start going through the math, you know, then it's like, like, this is going to be a really hard transition. And when you look at, you know, when you look at any major energy transitions, you know, they, that have happened, you know, when we went from coal to oil, when we went from wood to coal, um, you know, those transitions take a long, long time. And, um, and I just think that, um, you know, a lot of people got ginned up on, uh, you know, EV transactions, EV transitioning happening like that, you know, and I think now we're seeing a, an EV transition that's, you know, looking more like that. Why do you think dealerships aren't going away? Well, first, um, uh, you know, in North America, we have pretty strong franchise laws. That's number one. Um, second of all, you know, having, having worked at an OEM, um, um, you know, OEMs are not very good at running dealerships. Um, and, you know, occasionally an OEM, will take over a dealership, a troubled dealership. And uh, I often joke that if, if an OEM takes over a troubled dealership losing $5 million, you know, it's, it's not, no one should be surprised a year later when that dealership's losing $10 million. I mean, OEMs are great at what they do, but they're typically not very good at running dealerships. So that's number one. Number two, if you, if you just look at the value of dealerships, and again, I did math around this to help my, 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 my friends at Brookfield understand this. If you said, hey, let's say the average dealership value is 20, 20, 20, say $20 million, $25 million, just pick a number. And then if, 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 uh, if, uh, if an OEM wants to buy out 500 dealers, like that's a lot of money, right? And, and then think about the inventory on the lot and the, you know, the, the, the amount of capital that would have to be deployed against the dealership. So, you know, Two main reasons I, I don't see OEMs, I don't see dealers going away is one, um, dealers are good at what they do. They're great entrepreneurs. Uh, they figure out how to make money in, in changing times and conditions. Um, you know, two, OEMs are not very good uh, as a general rule running dealerships. And three, the amount of capital that they would have to deploy to try to run their own dealerships is, is too large, especially at a time when they have to make these, you know, mammoth investments in the uh, in new technologies for, for EVs and hybrids. You know, what I love asking you this question, or what I love about asking you specifically this question is that, and I ask this question a lot, you know, to, to other guests, but everyone brings a different perspective based on their skill set and experiences. And I feel like you sort of have this like first principles, very practical financial perspective. It's almost like non-emotional. It's like, hey, X, Y, and Z, this is the reality of the automotive industry in the US. And I think, well, it clearly makes sense given given what you do today, which is actually the, the next question I wanted to ask you. Clearly, your belief is that the dealership model is here to stay. Given that, can you tell us, just a, for anyone that's not too familiar with your brand and really what you're working on, can you just explain to us you know, what services and technology you're offering dealerships today? Yeah, so our company, the way to think uh, about our company in the simplest terms is we provide the mission-critical software to run a car dealership so uh when you buy a car you know we're the we're the brains and the spine of the dealership if you think about our company you know you have oems you have dealers and then you have retail customers and cdk is right in the middle of that we're connecting all three of those parties and so when you go in to buy a car um you know we are the system of record for roughly 55 percent of the cars sold in north america 
Uh, so if if you bought, you know, you you can do the math. If you bought three cars or four cars, there's roughly an 80 or 90 percent chance that uh, the car that you bought, uh, you went through the process using the CDK system. The, the salesperson took you through, you know, we're the we're the system of record for 53 percent of the repair orders in North America. So if you've taken your car to a dealership for repair, uh, most likely um, the software that was used for the repair order, the parts, the bill, et cetera, the accounting of that uh, happened on uh, on CDK systems. That kind of blew me away. That's I, I never knew that. That's the type of market share you have. I mean, we're, we're I'll give you another another car dealership guy a, a fun fact. It's, you know, it's it, we're a company. CDK is a company that you know most people never even heard of, right? Unless you work in the dealership business. I mean, a lot of people at OEMs don't even know us, right? But we we process through our systems five hundred billion dollars of automotive commerce. Five hundred billion dollars. That's like two and a half percent of the gross domestic product of the United States. What what is that all time time? What, what time period is that? That's in a year. Oh, that's in one in one year. Oh, so, sorry. So you're saying each year you have out of the, the gross merchandise value of all your dealerships combined, it's five hundred billion dollars. Yes, sir. And that's roughly two and a half percent of the GDP of the country. And so I, I always tell our employees, like, you know, we all know the auto industry matters, right? We know that's an industry that matters. Well, our company matters to that industry. I mean, you you pick if you pick any brand, any OEM, any brand, we are the uh, number one market share in that in that brand's dealerships for uh, for software. I, I mean, I guess we could say you have a little responsibility, not too much. We just have a little bit. we have a huge. That's exactly. It, we have a <laughs> we have a huge responsibility. We have an obligation to the industry, yeah, right? Because we I'm, provide I'm mission teasing. critical mission critical software for the for the business. I think over the last decade in general, we've had a lot of attempts at you know disruption. Again, I like to think that technology has the, or the pace of the adoption of technology for dealerships and really the demand by consumers for a better experience has risen in the last decade. No doubt about it. You know, people, everyone has a phone and all that stuff. How are you, given your position, how are you staying on top of all the tech needs and and what, you know, do dealerships really need to continue improving that experience so that customers don't go to, you know, a potential different source to acquire their car that maybe have a better customer experience? How are you doing that? Yeah, so so our company we just we just rolled out a a, a, a new software, a new class classification of software called the Dealership Experience Platform, and so this is a, a software platform that will allow a dealership to run its core business. And so one of the challenges that many dealerships have is they have you know fourteen, fifteen different vendors with different softwares they're using, and so people are logging into one system, doing something, rekey punching data somewhere else. You, you know, jumping to another screen. And what we're trying to do is help dealers simplify their environment so their employees and their customers can have a more seamless experience. And so we've, we're, we're super excited about, you know, our uh, dealership express platform, experience platform, which we, which we rolled out a few months ago. Um, so we, you know, that's how we are, you know, we're, we're here to help dealers sell and service cars. At the end of the day, that's our mission. How do we help dealers sell and service more cars? And so we, we, we stay on top. We, we visit dealers all the time. We have groups of dealers for focus groups, and we really try to, try to stay connected with our uh, customers. What are the biggest challenges for dealers or where's your, you know, kind of A1A of your focus when it comes to solving dealers problems? Yes. So, it's, you know, we obviously went through a period um, of, of great profitability and now we're, you know, we're coming out of that, right? We're, we're kind of coming back to normal or we're, you know, probably reasonably at normal today. Um, in terms of inventory levels, incentives are back up, all, all of the things. So, so now dealers have to get, you know, what I call back to the basics, employee efficiency, customer experience. You know, you have, you have to learn to sell cars again because in 21 and 22, you, you just kind of were there, right? And the customers had to come in. Here's the car. You like it. You don't like it. You don't like the price. Too bad. Now it's like, hey, well, we actually have to we have to sell cars, and so you know, there's some some of the same old problems are there. Employee turnover, always an issue. You know, getting the right employees so you can have the, <clears throat> you can have the right experience for your guests, driving efficiency, um, and giving your giving your uh, retail consumers a good experience. So it's we're kind of back to the you know what I would call the traditional set of experiences, 
um, and issues. Um, and then you also have this, you know, movement to, uh, as you said, customers want a differentiated experience. They want to, you know, do more online. They don't necessarily want to do everything online, but they want to do more online. You know, so how do how do dealerships bridge that, right? And I always I always like to say, you know, to people like if you think about our customers and and their customers, you know, if you're selling a Mitsubishi in Alabama, it's a little bit different, you know, process than selling a Mercedes in Manhattan, right? The the product's different, the customers are different. And, and, and so you can't, you can't just have the same cookie cutter experience, right? Um, be, because it's very different culturally, products different, customers different. So, so how, do, how do you bolt to that? How do you bolt to that? So, you know, we have, we have our, our software generally will have a consistent process, but then we have, we allow configuration, right? So how do you, how do you do, how do you let the dealers have some uh, control over the configuration of how they want to do certain things? Uh, differently based upon the market they're in, the brand they're in, or their philosophy. And one of the things that makes dealers very successful is, um, you know, they have their own business philosophy in their local community, and they, you know, may do things a little bit different uh, than the, the dealer, you know, 10 miles down the road with the same brand. And so you've got you've to work with them to have that, uh, some of that flexibility. I want to be devil's advocate for one second. The way I view, like, you know, just selling a car at a dealership, it's hard enough to do one thing well or, you know, work with one competent system, let alone with, you know, five, six different competent systems. So I guess my question is, why do you think you can integrate all these products or, you know, sort of offer one integrated platform to dealerships and do, you know, three, four, five things well when it's hard enough to do one thing well? What's your what's your thought on that? Yeah, so the way the way we think about um, our products and our, our our dealer needs is we look at we look at uh, what the dealer needs and then we think about should we buy it, should we build it, or should we partner? Okay, so sometimes we we say we don't we we just want to be a partner with somebody and we'll either resell it or integrate it. Other times we'll build it ourselves, and then sometimes we'll we'll buy the capability. So for example, CDK bought Roadster. Um, as as a way to accelerate uh, digital retailing, uh, you know, the company could have built it, but we bought Roadster and then we've integrated that. And then on the CRM side, um, uh, when I was at the company in 2018, we bought eLead, which was the leading CRM, and now we've we've done a great job, you know, integrating that into the platform. So it's really about it's really about figuring out buy, build a partner, and then once you have it. You, you, you integrate it. We've got lots of smart people. Um, you know, we spend about one hundred and fifty million dollars a year on research and development, which I, I always like to tell people that's more than the revenue of most of our competitors. Um, and so, you know, we have we have the money and we have the talent to integrate these things and create a better experience for our dealers. That's really refreshing. I think here's my thought, right? Like these are I've used Roadster Elites like for years and in, in, in e especially, I had, you know, way before digital retail was a thing. So I think it's smart. You take, like I said, a very first principles approach to it. Hey, what is the experience we want to offer and how can we get to that end state as best as possible, whether we buy it or build it? It's not initially where my head went, but I think it's a very good strategy. So I guess building on top of that, what do you typically look for in acquisition? Just give us like general principles that are important to you. Yeah, I mean, First, look, we're a technology company, so I, what's I, the tech I, I, stack? I might ha- I might have something to sell you after this one, so I'm trying to get some, take some notes <laughs> down. <laughs> you know, first, the, first, does it fit our strategy? Second, you know, tech stack's really important to us. Is it does it have a, a, a modern tech stack? What do we have to do to um, if if it does if it's not that modern? What would we have to do to do it? Um, the talent, you know, what what talent is there? How would they fit into our company? The culture would they be a good cultural fit? I mean, if you if you look through the annals of time, eighty percent of acquisitions do not achieve their desired uh, results. Okay, and why is that? Not because they got the wrong strategy. It, it's because the cultures don't fit. Right? It's the it's the people that when you put them together, they don't work. Um, and so so you know we spend a lot of time uh, thinking about the culture. Who are the key people? How would they fit in our company? You know where where would they report to? How does it fit in our org structure? So those are those are really, um, you know, the, the, a lot of the soft side things that I think about. Having having been around a lot of acquisitions, 
some that worked really, really well and some that were, you know, complete bust. And, um, and so that, you know, that you can never underestimate the soft side. Obviously on the hard side, you're looking at the market, the market share, the customers, you know, how do we have CDK customers that would be a natural place for, for them to buy that if we owned it? Like all of those, what I call the hard technical things, um, you know, and there's a, a lots of great playbooks for that. But then what I do is also, you know, really think about the soft side of things, because if you, uh, if you really need the people, uh, then they got to fit in your organization and your culture. If you just want the tech and the people aren't that important, then, then maybe that's okay if they don't fit. Is there, so are, are you looking for anything now? Is there any acquisitions on the radar that you can share with us or not specific companies, but any trends that you're focused on? Yeah. So, you know, we're, we're always looking, um, we're always, uh, you know, talking to people again in the same buy, build or partner model. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting that, you know, the, the market peaked in 21, obviously and valuations got really high. I think there's still an adjustment happening in the market where, uh, sellers are still, you know, have the 21, 2021 valuations in their head. So their, their expectations around value are still a little high. Um, and so, and so they're, you know, they're, they're not quite coming to market yet. So, so we're always, we're always in the mix. We're always in the mix talking to people. And, uh, you know, obviously I can't uh, tell you any companies, but we're, we're always in the mix, uh, looking at things and talking to people. And typically what we do is, you know, we, we, we see a part of the business where, you know, we, we, we think we'd like to buy, and then we go talk to companies in that space. And maybe we find a way to partner with them first, see if it's a good fit learn more about the product, then maybe we buy them later, or, you know, we just decide to partner. So we're always, you know, we're always in the mix talking to people and, and, and thinking about, um, you know, what we might buy. When, and when it comes to AI, are you, are you implementing any of that into your software right now? Or I, I have, I have this conversation a lot with many different types of guests and, you know, everyone's sort of doing a different perspective, again, based on their experiences. But I'm curious to know if you think that there's real potential here to change what it's like to buy or sell a car, or maybe it's a little bit overhyped. Like, where are you on that pendulum? You know, AI is like super hyped right now. Um, but look, it, it's a new technology and it's, you know, it is going to change things like all new technology. It will take time, but you know we've we've had some AI in our products for you know a number of years actually. It's been around, uh, you know AI's been around for a few years, and we'll have more announcements as we put more AI into into a number of our products, and and so I I do think it'll drive you know efficiency um, in the dealerships and the process. I mean, if you think about go back to when search came, right? Think about think about when Google started, um, and then it just became so easy, just like. To Google everything, right? And then Google, you know, the the, the more searches you did, uh, the better Google got, right? And they got more data. And I think that's the advantage CDK has uh, for AI. I mean, AI is not so much about the technology; it's about the data. Because the more data you have, then the machine learning can 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 drive better results with that. And, and given point. that, yeah, given that we're, you know. 53% of the repair orders written in North America, we've got the data. 55% of the cars sold in North America, we've got the data. So I think over time, you know, our AI will be really, really good compared to somebody that's got, you know, 300 dealerships and, and an AI tool on that. Well, they don't, have, they don't have the data set. So that's kind of the key thing about AI is what data you have access to, and, and, you know, what are you doing with that data? That's what, that's why you see this, you know, you see all the BMS of tech, right? There's this huge war, you know, with all the giants on trying to make their AI uh, the most prominent, you know, tool set, right? Because if you, you know, if you go back to search, uh, same thing, I'll go back to Google search, right? Google won the search wars, right? They got the most data and, um, and, um, and, and then whatever they have, 80% market of the search, right? They won that war. And, uh, you know, oddly enough, um, you know, I know that one uh, relatively because I was at Dell and we did a deal with Google to make Google the standard search on all Dell PCs. Well, yeah, we, we missed that. So that's an important part. <laughs> and, um, you know, this was at a point in time when Dell had 50% market share. So, yeah, you, you know. When I, was I, this? When was this? What years? Probably 2006 or seven. So I was running M&A and partnerships for Dell. 
that's when Google was really taking off. And, um, and, and that's exactly what's happening now with AI. You have all the big companies and they're trying to win that data war. I call it a land grab. Like it's really a, who, who can get the land grab so that you have the, you have the dominant, um, you know, AI tool. Uh, and therefore you get the most data. It's quite fascinating to watch. Well, you definitely have a lot of data. So maybe we'll get a, a licensing deal with one of these uh, <laughs> generative AI companies. I was smiling when you were chatting because you were talking about the importance of data. And the first thing that comes to my head is like, data is the new oil. Then I remembered that you were in the oil industry. <laughs> so I'm like, you're the living manifestation of data as the new oil. It's great. <laughs> like you would literally went from oil to data. So uh, it's epic. Here's a question for you, more general. I think I think about myself when I was, you know, coming up in industry. I had no idea what CDK was. I mean, I barely even knew what a DMS was. Right? Let's go like back in the day. As as you grow and you know, in, in the dealer in the dealer industry, right up the ranks, you're obviously well way more acquainted with all the different systems. My question to you is: At what point does a dealership typically adopt your type of software? Right? Because if if what you're offering, all this product development, is this for you know only big groups, middle groups, and really the ultimate question I want to get to here is like, are the smaller groups sort of is there a future for them in this industry? So I know it's sort of fully loaded question, but what's that's your what's your yeah, take on all that? That's, that's, there's a lot in that question, but let let me take it in two parts. So look, our our software, um, you know, services dealers large and small. Now, I mean, we're we have enterprise class software. So if you have a small dealership in Iowa that sells 10 cars a month, you probably don't need our software or you, you know, you may not want to pay for our software, right? You may want to go to one of our competitors, like I call them cheap and cheerful that are, are you know, smaller for smaller dealers. Uh, but, but, you know, we cover dealers from, you know, one store, you know, all the way up to Lithia, right? And, um, and so, um, and, and we, we kind of approach they're all they're all important right uh and so i i mean you know we as you go up in size you know there's there's less competitors uh because they don't have the capabilities uh for larger groups right so we have the best the enterprise class grade we have the largest dealers the publics you know the the large consolidators and 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 our you know capabilities you know really fit what they have whereas you know, the majority of our competitors cannot service them. Um, and so your question around, um, is there a future for, for, you know, one to five dealership groups? I mean, I'm from Canada. I've lived in the U.S. a long time. I mean, these are rural countries, right? And so there's lots of small towns and smaller dealerships. And so I, I do think that, um, you know, the smaller groups will be around for a long time, be more, I think, you know, smaller towns and, and more rural areas. Uh, but you know, if you have a if you have a a family business and you have a couple dealerships and you're in you know rural Iowa, um, you're not that interesting to a consolidator, right? Uh, consolidators are looking to get the density, share people, you know, get get some brand awareness in a market. And so I do think that you know that that uh, these smaller dealer groups will be around for a long time. Now, you know that that those groups are shrinking. That you know the number of dealerships that are one to five rooftops, uh, you know, that's shrinking um, because they're getting consolidated. Um, but I do think uh, it's not going to zero for sure. And, and I agree with you. I don't think it's going to zero either. I do think there are some embedded advantages for the bigger groups, just, you know, operating leverage, scale. And, and r realistically, I mean, all the technology we have today, you know, having specialists manage that stuff, it, it costs money. And just like when social media started and suddenly you needed someone to manage your social media, I just, you know, kind of came out of nowhere. Um, so that's sort of been my take about on just industry in general. W when you think about, but when you think about dealers, big and small, ha are you seeing any like hesitancy on their buying power? Like, are, are you seeing, I, I call it like the SaaS fatigue. Is there anything with dealers that you're seeing that they're just like, tapped out like i don't i can't use another tool whether actually i use it or even spend money on it like i'm i'm done like i can't do this anymore how what are you seeing on that side of the world yeah no what i mean what what i see and and hear a lot is hey i've got you know 14 different software vendors i'm not sure you know how i use them do i need them you know when i have a problem i don't know who who to call 
Um, and so I, I do see a trend of dealers wanting to simplify down their vendors, um, you know, some to one, um, but, you know, maybe a few. And, and so there's always this balancing act, right? Dealers, dealers like choice and dealers like to experiment, right? They're classic entrepreneurs. So, hey, this new tool coming to the market, well, let me try it. Let me try it, see if it helps me, all right? And then, oh, maybe it doesn't help me, I'll drop it. So, but, so there's always that pressure of like, I wanna have less vendors and less, less complexity in my operations uh, versus like, hey, there's a, a bright, shiny object that maybe helps me sell more cars or, or get more gross or whatever. And so I, maybe I'll try that. So I think that's always the balancing act. But, but that's why what, when we brought the dealership experience platform to the market, it's really meant to give a dealer a you know, foundation of what you need to run your business with you know, this base level of capabilities so you can, you can uh, you know, knock out uh, some other vendors, knock out some, some competitive products that you're playing that are duplicative to what you get in the, in the CDK dealership experience platform. And, and what are you seeing, like when, when dealers are using that, is it like, you know, what's the core value ultimately that people are telling you? Like anecdotally, or, or I mean, you clearly have the data, but is it ultimately that I don't have to switch from 50 different systems or like, what is that, you know, that, that main thing that you're seeing? Yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, you know, some basics. I don't, your, your employees don't have to log into a couple different systems. They don't have to re-key punch data, data consistency, because that's the other thing when you start having data going from this system to that system that's to that worst. system, <laughs> yeah. then all of a sudden, like, oh, the prices are different, the taxes are different, the fees are different, whatever, right? And now you're like, okay, now somebody has to reconcile that um, or you get a visit, you know, from, from the accounting office, um, you know, after month end about something that, that doesn't reconcile, right? So I think it's, how do you get that consistency and, and ease of use and uh, consistency of the data flow? So before we wrap up, I want to ask you some speculative questions because I love speculating. So this is always a fun part. But, you know, again, being in your position, I have to imagine you have an interesting opinion on new OEMs or, you know, as, as we think about the next decade, do you think that we're going to see some new potential players, you know, whether it be Chinese or, you know, Vietnamese or whoever, but any major players you think are going to enter the U.S. market? Like, yeah, I, look, I mean, they're already here, put the, put the Chinese uh, OEMs aside for a minute, but they're, you know, the, they're obviously, you know, Vinfast is here, Fisker's here. You know, I, I do think there's going to be a, a bit of a washout, uh, you know, of, of some of the new entrants. And, you know, it's just, I was just having dinner with the dealer. We were talking about some of the new entrants and like, you know, it's hard to know who's going to make it, right? <clears throat> who's going to go yeah. back? You know, I, again, I try to look at things through the annals of time. And so, you know, I think about uh, in the 60s and 70s, you know, when the Japanese came and the Koreans came, you know, it was hard to figure out. Like, like uh, I'm old enough to remember when Hyundai came to Canada in the in the mid 80s and cars couldn't handle the cold. Right. And they they came in the market, they left, they learned a lot and then they came back and obviously a roaring success. So so it's hard to you know, it's hard to know. Right. Who's going to um, who's going to really succeed. And I, but I, I do think we'll see a, a washout of a lot of the new entrants that we've seen, you know, in the SPAC bubble. We saw a lot of, uh, we saw a lot of players, you know, in, in what I call the SPAC bubble, uh, you know, get a lot of money and try to start up an EV company. Some of them are not going to make it, you know, Lordstown's gone bankrupt already, but other ones have deep pockets, you know, good backers. I think the Chinese will come eventually. I think when the Chinese come, they'll, they'll use the dealership model. Uh, they won't go direct. I think it's really fascinating that, you know, Fisker is now, um, you know, said they're going to use a distribution model and dealers have been, been fast, the same. Toyota came, you know, Nissan came, Datsun, you know, when they came, they used the dealership model, right? And uh, and it, it, they've been very successful over 30, 40 years. You know, I, I think we'll see a, a move to the dealership model. And then I think what, you know, what I'm watching is I'm watching the Chinese players more in Europe. And we, we don't have a European business, but I'm sort of following because because they're going into Europe first, and then I think they'll come to the, to the to the U.S. after that. But I think when they come to the U.S., they'll use the dealership model, which again is that this is the great thing about dealers. And what, you know, we we didn't really get there, but you know, this is why dealer consolidation makes sense because if you have 12 brands and one brand is really underperforming or something, you know, happens with that brand, if you think about you know, VW, what happened with VW a few years ago, right? If you're like, 
a single point VW store, you know, that's tough. It was tough. And VW, you know, stood behind and helped their dealers. But if you have a breadth of, you know, if you have a breadth of dealers, you're, you, 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 you've, you've got a, you know, a balanced portfolio and uh, based upon what's happening in any one brand. Well said. I think the same thing could be said for EVs. And I know some dealers that, you know, and I, and I like to split EVs when I, uh, I like to, you know, say Tesla and everyone else, because I just think that it's a tale of two worlds there. I, I, I see it the same way. It's, I think Tesla has their model and their distribution model. You know, I always tell people Tesla has dealerships too. Um, they're just called Tesla dealerships. Um, and, and no, I, I, I see the world the same way. I think you, you have Tesla and kind of everyone else. Absolutely. Oh, I'm sure you have grand plans for NADA conference in Las Vegas. And, uh, you know, just coming up now, can you walk us through a little bit of your plans? I mean, I'd love to meet up there, meet you as well. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great time to get, you know, I, I really like we get to see a lot of customers, current customers, prospective customers, partners. Um, it's, you know, there's a lot of, always a lot of energy. I tend to come in a, a couple of days before the show and, and, and do some meetings with partners, spend a lot of time with our employees that are, you know, going to be uh, at the booth. Uh, meeting with uh, dealers, our whole leadership team comes and, you know, we just have back to back customer meetings and then dinners. And then we have a we have a nice uh, party that we invite our customers to. And and so it's it's a super busy time, super exciting, lots of energy. I think la- last year was great. I mean, last year, sort of after COVID, people were happy to to be back and get get things back to normal. And and uh, I think this show will be even uh, even better than last year. Vegas tends to draw a little more crowd. Last year was in Dallas. <laughs> and Vegas, yeah, I remember. Vegas will, will, will get more people to uh, to come there for sure. I know. I know. Yeah. I'm, it, I, I I remember. Yeah. Dallas is uh, definitely different. Well, I'm looking forward to meeting Brian. This has been super fun. Thanks for coming on. If anyone wants to get in touch with you or wants to learn more about CDK Global and your dealership experience platform, where can they go? Uh, they go to cdk.com. It's a hell of a domain. Or they, or they can <laughs> send me an email at bpm at cdk.com. We'll make sure somebody reaches out to them or I'll reach out to them myself. Love it. And we'll uh, we'll also put the link in the show notes below. So we'll, we'll, get, uh, we'll get it linked up. So Brian, thanks so much for coming on. This has been really fun. All right. Thank you. All right. Hope you enjoyed that episode. Please give the podcast a rating. Consider subscribing to the show and check the show notes for links to what we talked about. Thanks for tuning in. I'll see you guys next time.